Good evening, everyone, and thank you for the uh, coming to the first fee brown bag for 2018. I'm very excited tonight to be a host for kicking off the month of Howard Marks, where we're going to discuss all about data protection. Uh, tonight, the episode is How and Why of RAID. As always, uh, I am Tom Green, and I'm going to be your host and be monitoring Twitter. If you want to get in on the conversation, ask Howard questions, uh, try to throw him off his game, whatever you want to do, uh, tweet the hashtag vbrownbag or at vbrownbag's handle, and we'll definitely get the, uh, the question in and get a uh, good answer from Howard. vbrownbag is... Uh, international affair. We have shows in time zones all across the world. Uh, we have Latin America, Europe, APAC, and US, and you can see the schedule and sign up for your favorite podcast in your favorite time zone at vbrownbag.com slash brownbags. Uh, so without any further ado, I'm going to hand the microphone over to Howard. Uh, Howard, uh, would you like to say hi? Hi. <clears throat> And you should have presenter now. Okay, which screen do you guys see? Uh, the slide deck. Excellent. All right. So, welcome to All About Data Protection Part 1, the why and how of RAID. Um, <clears throat> this presentation is derived from a series of blog posts. I'm in the process of writing Every once in a while, I figure it's good to return to base principles. You, of course, are at this point asking, who is this guy? And I, you're not so humble speaker. Um, I spent 30 years as a consultant and writing for trade magazines like PC Magazine <clears throat> and Land Magazine. I'm now the chief scientist at Deep Storage LLC, which is an independent test lab and analyst firm where we do things like prove that scale out storage systems can survive a node failure uh, by causing a node to fail with about five pounds of thermite. Um, I'm also the co host of the Graybeards on Storage podcast with my fellow analyst, Ray Lucchese. You can reach me on Twitter at, at DeepStorageNet or via email at hmarks at deepstorage.net. Basically, I come from the school of been there, done that. And I have heard and read in blog posts just too many times recently um, things that just don't quite ring true about how the technologies we use to protect our data actually work. And it, I felt compelled to return to first principles and talk about RAID and data protection and all the technologies that have grown out of that so that we can ha all have a common base of terminology to work from. <clears throat> the key thought that you have to remember about RAID is that RAID evolved as a response to the SLED. And from the 1950s, when the IBM RAMAC on the left was first introduced and stored a whopping five megabytes of data through the <clears throat> washing machine drives with 13 platter packs of my youth to the IBM 3380, kind of the ultimate sled that had two active sets of heads so that you could get more IOPS out of it. Um, that was what real computers used. PCs, the toys that we used the back then that were based on I, the Intel x86 processors, used five and a quarter and three and a half inch drives. And they were a lot slower and they were somewhat less reliable than the 3380s and the washing machines, but they were much less expensive. And 
Clayton Christensen, in his classic book, The Innovator's Dilemma, used the disk drive industry as the one of his examples of what he called disruption, which despite the fact that people in Silicon Valley use disruption to simply mean to screw with an existing market, Christensen had a very clear definition in mind of disruption about how products which came to market as technically inferior but much less expensive, like the ST506 disk drive, would evolve to replace the much more expensive, more capable systems that drove the market when they were introduced. And this is exactly what happened in the disk drive business. So where did RAID come from? Well, if we're talking about this kind of RAID, from Johnson Wax. And, you know, having grown up in New York, RAID has been part of my life since my earliest days. But if we're not talking about insecticides, but re redundant arrays of inexpensive disks, then we can credit a single paper by David Patterson, Garth Gibson, and Randy Katz of Berkeley in 1988 with the term RAID and with the taxonomy that we've used ever since to define standard RAID levels one through five. Um, a few years later, the some of us made jokes about how now that there were small high performance disks, they weren't necessarily inexpensive anymore. And the industry changed the I from inexpensive to independent, um, as opposed to slide, which says that we changed it from inexpensive to inexpensive. Uh, but the I became independent around 1995. It's a minor point. Uh, when we talk about RAID, remember, RAID is about disks. So Drive A is mirrored or striped with drives B through E. And the unit of integrity, the unit of atomicity is the drive. And so the various RAID levels have multiple copies or add parity to improve resilience. By striping data across multiple drives, we get better performance. But RAID conceptually was thought of as how do we take in identical drives and turn them into one larger logical device that provides a greater capacity and or greater performance. So if you have five drives like I have on the slide of differing sizes, traditional RAID, what we're talking about today, <clears throat> will only use the amount of capacity on each drive that is the smallest drive. The key to RAID, and in fact to primary data protection everywhere is storing data as a combination of strips and stripes. So if we have an array, and in the example on the screen, we have a five drive single parity array, we write a strip of data, excuse me, we write a strip of data to each of the disk drives and the set of data that's across all of those disk drives we refer to as a stripe. <clears throat> Unfortunately, the industry has not been very consistent in this terminology. This is the IT industry. We haven't been very consistent in all kinds of terminologies. And so you will sometimes read stripe size when they really mean how big is the chunk of data 
on each disk. I'm going to be very explicit <coughs> in this webinar to use strip to mean data on one drive and stripe to mean a set of related data. The most basic form of RAID isn't in fact in Patterson's paper because it's not redundant. And we call that RAID zero. Um, and that basically is simply striping data across the drives. And so if you look at the four drives in this stripe set, the first chunk of data, the first strip is A, it's written to drive A, the second strip is written to drive B, the third strip is written to drive C, and so on. By <coughs> round robining stripes across the multiple drives, we get all of the head positioners in all of those drives active we get aggregate performance that is approximately the number of drives times the performance of the drive. The problem, of course, is that it is not repeat, not redundant. If you build a RAID 0 array and have any failure at all, you will, with most implementations, have a completely unrecoverable data set and lose all of your data. Before SSDs, <clears throat> RAID 0 sets were frequently used as scratch space for applications like video editing where a <clears throat> operator would download a batch of video from a common repository to a RAID 0 array on their workstation while they edited it with Adobe Premiere, Final Cut Pro, or Avid, and then write it back. If a drive failed, <clears throat> all the edits the operator had performed during that session would be lost, but since it was just a copy, the risk was worth the additional performance. I don't see any good uses for RAID 0 in the SSD era until you reach the point where you need the aggregate performance of multiple NVMe SSDs, in which case, please give me a call. I would love to consult on that project. You obviously have deep pockets. <clears throat> um, one simple variation of RAID 0 is a concatenated drive where data simply is written to the first drive until the first drive is full and then spills over onto the second drive. Uh, Linux LVM calls these linear volumes. They can, unlike RAID, uh, easily accommodate drives of dissimilar capacity. Mostly it performs like a single drive, so you're getting um, additional capacity without any additional performance or resiliency. Not really something we do much of in the industry. <clears throat> what we do a lot of, however, is drive mirroring. And here, I'd like to mention that um, all of the authors of the original paper, Patterson, Gibson, and Katz, have admitted that they didn't invent any of these technologies. Uh, <clears throat> mirroring had been a, around for a while. Um, I was using it in, you know, personally in the form of Novell Netware's SFT Level 2, which mirrored disk drives. Um, data was, is, was written to two drives. And then in the Netware environment, <clears throat> the next question was whether the two drives were on independent controllers or not. Um, as we'll see in next week's episode, the disk drives of the 80s were you know, kind of smart as a bag of rocks. And <clears throat> so if you had two disk drives on the same controller, the controller could really only talk to one at a time. There was no deep command queue. So NetWare, if you had two drives on the same controller, called that mirroring in it wrote all the data to both drives and then read all the data from the A drive. 
Um, but if the two drives were on separate controllers, then that was in NetWare parlance and this terminology was adopted by Windows later, um, that was duplexed and it would split reads between the two drives, uh, queuing reads to the drive whose positioner was closest to the data. So <clears throat> RAID 1 both provided N plus 1 protection in case of a drive failure, <coughs> but for reads, it also provided about twice the performance of a single drive. For writes, it provided about the same performance as a single drive. The downside, of course, is that RAID 1 only provides protection at the cost of 100% overhead that for every byte of data I need to actually store, I need to provide two bytes of storage capacity. <clears throat> the first major variation of mirroring is the three-way mirror. Uh, products like EMC's early symmetric systems um, and the Veritas volume manager would allow you to have N plus two resiliency, of course, at the cost of 200% overhead. But this also enabled the third mirror to be split off at some arbitrary point in time to create a snapshot. While modern storage systems provide low-cost snapshots, <clears throat> back in the 90s and early 2000s, a three-way mirror was the high-performance snapshot mechanism, even though it had very high overhead. Uh, by the turn of the century, we had developed metadata-based snapshots to the extent that three-way mirrors and split mirror snaps were no longer a major part of the industry, but distributed systems like Hadoop and the Hadoop file system, HDFS, started doing three-way replication as their primary data protection mechanism. So the idea returned again. <clears throat> RAID 2 and 3 are basically obsolete and not even worth talking deeply about for historical purposes. RAID 2 and RAID 3, well, RAID 2 did bitwise striping and it was inspired by memory ECC. I don't remember ever actually seeing a commercial product. It only worked at specific combinations of data and ECC. <clears throat> RAID 3 actually made it to market. Um, it was a byte-wise striping system, and there was a dedicated parity disk. Um, the only product I remember using with it was uh, the compact internal disk array card that was in the first System Pro, the first x86 server. And it had to be run with specific model Connor peripheral drives because in order to do the bitewise or the bitwise striping, these require the drive spindles of the drives be synchronized. <clears throat> As the I in RAID changed from inexpensive to independent, this kind of special drive interdependency became much less attractive. As we'll see next week when we talk about the evolution of disk drives, as disk drives got smarter and smarter and only would transfer 512-byte blocks, the idea of bitwise or bytewise data protection didn't make any sense. And so RAID 2 and 3 are just completely obsolete. They are not only dead, they have no logical descendants. <clears throat> now, I've used the term 
parody a couple of times already today. And I wanted to take a second to talk about what we mean by parody mathematically and how that could be really helpful in <clears throat> doing data protection in real time. So parity is by definition any one bit forward error correction or erasure code. Now by forward error correction that means a code which sends additional data which will allow the data to be reconstructed if there is a transmission error. <clears throat> and an erasure code is a code designed to deal with the specific error of some data being corrupted or missing. So I first ran into the concept of parity back in the day when we built multi-user systems that used RS-232 dumb terminals. <clears throat> that asynchronous serial port would send for every byte of data a start bit and then the eight data bits. And then optionally you could have a parity bit. And that you could select that parity bit be either even or odd. And if the parity was odd, then the parity bit would be a one if there were an odd number of ones in the eight data bits and a zero if there were an even number of bits in the eight data bits, even number of one bits. <clears throat> of course, even parity being exactly the opposite. And so when this byte of data arrived from the terminal to the computer, it could recalculate the parity and see if there had been an error in the transmission and if it calculated that the parity should be one even and it came up as zero then it could request the data be retransmitted in the concept of raid and erasure coding and distributed raid and unraid and beyond raid and any other mechanism i know of to do n plus one data protection where n is greater than one, <coughs> the mechanism for calculating parity is the Boolean exclusive OR function, which we abbreviate XOR, or <coughs> we use that crossed symbol, circle symbol. And the truth table for exclusive OR is very simple. If the two bits are the same, then the XOR of those two bits is a zero. If the two bits are different, then the XOR is a one. So there's a function called OR, where if either A or B is a one, then A or B is a one. XOR, if A or one B is a one, but not if both A or B is a one, is X or one. <clears throat> In fact, if you look at it like my mathematician friend, Dr. Rachel, an X or is addition, but if it generates an additional higher order bit, you discard it. So it's modulus two addition. And so if we X or, these two 8-bit numbers, as I do in the, on the slide, we get another 8-bit <clears throat> number. The interesting part is if we XOR that result, so if we, so we X, A XOR B equals P. So this, the top number is A, the middle number is B, the sum <clears throat> is P. A XOR B equals excuse me, A, A, so we have A and B in parity. If we XOR parity with either A or B, we get the other B or A. So A XOR parity equals B, B XOR parity equals A. It's all completely associative. 
<clears throat> so if we have multiple data strips, A, B, C, D, and we XOR them all together, if we can't read the data from any one of those strips, we can XOR the parity with the remaining strips to get that the data that is on the missing strip. <clears throat> so parity allows us to have one <clears throat> bit or strip of parity provide protection for n strips of data where n is an arbitrary number. So for a four data plus parity RAID set, P equals A, X or B, X or C, X or D. <clears throat> if B is missing, we simply X or A, C, D, and parity, and the result is the data that was in B. <clears throat> parity RAID, in the simple case, is RAID 4. A data strip is typically 4 to 64K. They can sometimes be substantially larger on systems designed primarily for streaming data. XOR parity stored on a dedicated drive. <clears throat> the problem with any parity-based systems is that a small write always has to update the parity for that strip, even if it doesn't update all of the data for that strip. Since all of the parity strips are on the same disk, that disk will become a bottleneck. And the overhead for RAID 4 is 10 to 50 percent. <clears throat> RAID 4 is used, it's primarily used on NetApp systems, <clears throat> and it works just fine as long as writes are as large as a full stripe across all of the drives, which keeps the parity strip from being a bottleneck. That's accomplished in a log-based file system like NetApp's Waffle, but that really is more material for a later episode. <clears throat> RAID 5 simply eliminates the bottleneck at the parity drive by rotating parity from drive to drive by stripe. While RAID 4 is uncommon, it's usually how we explain parity RAID, RAID 5 is the much more commonly implemented model. Um, it still has the problem that any parity RAID system has, that is, when there's a small write, you need to have, <clears throat> you need to read data modify it, write it back, and then recalculate the parity. Um, it is usually explained that this requires reading data from all of the remaining data drives. That's simply not true. <clears throat> if a write is smaller than a single strip, less smaller than the data on a single drive. That's the worst case. That one small IO, say 4K write into a 64K strip, requires reading the strip, the 64K, reading the parity for that stripe, modifying <clears throat> the strip in memory by replacing the 4K, recalculating the parity, and then writing the data to the affected data strip and to the parity strip. Regardless of the size of the write, it can always come down to this four to one expansion. It can occasionally be less if you're writing 64K into a 64K strip, you can eliminate the first read and have it be three IOs instead of one. But <clears throat> any parity-based system has this IO expansion caused by the read, modify, write cycle. Uh, this has led 
the to the creation of an organization, uh, BARF, the Brotherhood Against All Raid, uh, who are primarily database administrators who believe that they should always have RAID 10 <clears throat> so that they don't have the read after write case. Um, RAID 10, of course, always has two to one IO expansion for small IOs as opposed to three or four to one for RAID 5. So <clears throat> they're, the DBAs are not completely wrong. So Howard, uh, we have a comment on Twitter from Matt Crape saying RAID 5 is the devil's raid. Uh, uh, on paper, it offers the best balance of capacity and protection, but with disk sizes being so big, it's very risky. Yes. So allow me to say that any traditional raid, so anything where we're working with full disks, <clears throat> is dangerous with large disk drives. Uh, the, disk, when we, the, the disk drives that we have today are so large compared to their bandwidth that they're primary, you know, if we're talking about the 10 and 12 terabyte drives, those are designed for people who are buying hundreds of them, <clears throat> who are using a, a more distributed block-based system that we will get to, I think, in episode three. Um, where the rebuild is many to many, not many to one. Um, but RAID and, you know, traditional RAID and very large disk drives, I think, are a bad match. And uh, <clears throat> about RAID 5 being the devil's RAID, I don't know. I, I remember I've used RAID 3. But unless Matt has more comments, moving along. No, I think we're good. Thank you very much, Howard. <clears throat> One really interesting variant, uh, the first EMC symmetrics I ever worked on uh, was before fiber channel. So this thing had 16 high voltage differential SCSI cables coming out of it. So you could connect it to 16 hosts. And it ran RAID S, where there were three nine gigabyte drives and so it was two data drives and a parity drive, but it didn't present itself as one 18 gigabyte LUN <clears throat> using RAID 4 or 5. It presented two drives A and B and then calculated parity in the background. It stored it on the parity disk, but you had two 9 gig drives um, so that it could continue to emulate the particular model of IBM drive that the AS400, which was using a couple of the SCSI ports, wanted to see. <clears throat> uh, luckily, this variant is no longer with us. So for, for, RAID, for RAID S, would you run out of space on your parity disk if they're all nine gig drives? No, no, because it, it if you wrote to drive A, it would read the data from drive B and XOR it and save it as parity. Okay, I get you. Yeah. So it it was still it's the right amount of parity storage. It's just a little, you know, it it, it felt weird then and it died off because it felt weird to everybody else too. Um, but when we're talking about weird, we've got beyond raid and unraid. Um, <clears throat> so these are you know both solutions by people who <coughs> thought RAID was perfectly good for data centers, but that uh, the, the prosumer and home users needed something different. And UnRAID is a NAS OS. You can have X disk drives, and each one is a file system. <coughs> and then there's a common namespace above that file system, so a folder in the common namespace points to a folder on one disk drive. And then like RAID S, when you write to one disk drive, it reads the parity and modifies the parity and updates it. So there is parity and the parity drive just has to be 
as big as the largest drive because if you're talking about writing to the third terabyte of a two terabyte drive, you just it would just XOR in zeros and it doesn't matter. Um, it's very interesting for sure. We can just slap another disk drive in there and expand capacity. Whatever you got, doesn't matter. Drobo uh, built a so simple you don't have to worry about it RAID system they called Beyond RAID where you said, I want to be protected against one drive failure or two drive failures. <clears throat> and it would mirror and do single parity and do double parity um, across as many drives as it, as it had of that size. So in this case, you know, I have drives of three different sizes and I said, I want to be protected against one drive failure. So there are seven drive the, so it creates a zone across the <clears throat> smallest drives and their amount of capacity in the larger drives and then smaller zones as the drives get smaller again it's an economy use every bit of every drive you have kind of thing that never really caught on although um, with the distributed chunklet style systems the use of drives of different sizes is not the problem that it is with traditional RAID. <clears throat> the problem with RAID 5 is it doesn't provide enough protection. If one drive fails and nobody notices and replaces it for several months, and then a second drive fails, you lose your data. And I have been there and seen that happen. And so <clears throat> for various reasons, we want higher redundancy. And so if one parity strip is good, two parity strips must be better. And so we get RAID 6 and it's twice the parity. So we have N plus two resilience. We can lose two disk drives. There are multiple, I'm very <clears throat> ecumenical. I take a broad view of the definition of RAID 6. Any mechanism that stores N data strips plus two parity strips to me is RAID 6. That So it could, like the SNEA document says, it should use Reed Solomon <clears throat> erasure coding. Uh, as I was discussing with Tom before the webinar started, I wish I understood the algebra in the Galois field that's required to calculate Reed Solomon codes. I fully admit that I reach my math boggle limit at Reed Solomon. So I look at Reed Solomon, and Reed Solomon is a black box that people who I trust have told me it has been proven works. And when I talk to mathematicians, I know the word proven has a very specific meaning. When something's been proven to work, I don't have to worry about it. <clears throat> and that black box, I can say, here's a block of data. Please calculate N parity codes to go with it. And out of the black box come N parity strips. And in this case, N would be two. And so the first RAID 6 implementations used Reed Solomon. Reed Solomon is computationally expensive. I mean, if it's math, I don't understand. It's definitely math that's going to take a lot of CPU cycles. Um, a couple of smart guys came up with <clears throat> mechanisms that used diagonal parity, IBM's odd even and NetApp's rotating diagonal parity. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, it doesn't matter whether it's dedicated parity drives or rotating parity, I'll still call it RAID 6. And again, whether dedicated parity drives or rotating parity is a better idea really depends on the, the overlying file system and how it writes data down to the data protection layer. If that happens in large full stripe writes, then dedicated parity works just as well as rotating parity. 
<clears throat> so if we want to take a look at diagonal parity, I put together a very small example. So the P drive holds standard parity. So we have the peach. That's, yeah, that crayon was called peach when I bought it back when I was a child. So <clears throat> row one in peach generates parity horizontally. <clears throat> and then the Q column or the Q drive is parity calculated diagonally. So the strips with the bright green outline make up the first green stripe strip on drive Q. Um, <clears throat> so this is roughly IBM's odd even algorithm. I did not copy it explicitly. Um, this may not be provable to be a proper diagonal parity scheme in that one, there may be some combination of drives which may result in data being lost, but both odd even and RDP, both of which are patented by the way, um, have been proven so that you can do diagonal parity. <clears throat> and this means that you can do all of the calculations required to do RAID 6 with XOR. And this was a big deal uh, in the early, early and mid 90s because x86 processors didn't do XOR very well. But I, Intel had a, another processor, the i960, that did. It was a RISC processor. And all of the RAID controllers were based on the i960 so that they could calculate XOR. And they, those <clears throat> processors didn't have enough horsepower for general purpose math to do Reed Solomon, but they could do diagonal parity lickety split. Um, so again, it's just getting deeper into the math of how uh, the RAID, how RAID 6 can be implemented just using XOR and therefore not being terribly um, computationally expensive. <clears throat> Which brings us to the right hole or the dreaded right hole. Um, the problem is if a RAID set consists of N independent drives, <coughs> then those drives are independent. But the right of data and parity has to be atomic. That we can't have a case where we've updated one data strip of a stripe, but have not updated any other data strips of that stripe that are part of that right, part of that transaction, and also updated the parity. Normally, when people talk about this, they talk about it as resulting in incorrect parity and in that you can scrub the drive and recalculate parity. But that's making a big assumption that data is written in order, data one, data two, data three, data four, parity, and that any failure that occurred bef between those rights occurred not between data one and data two, but between data four and parity. So it can be invalid or corrupt data <clears throat> if any failure occurs while the system's in the midst of a write to a RAID set. Luckily, we've developed all sorts of techniques in enterprise storage systems to reduce the write hole. We have NVRAM caches. The NVRAM cache holds the data in a dirty state until it's gotten acknowledgments from all of the disk drives. We have journaling metadata. We have many techniques to address and reduce the size of the right hole small enough that it can be ignored. This has typically been a bigger problem with software-based RAID and logical volume managers, but <clears throat> even the Linux kernel MD RAID module got a 
journal that can be SSDs or memory in uh, kernel 4.4, I think it was in 2015. So the right hole is one of those theoretical problems that we've addressed by building products that are better than the theory says they should be. <clears throat> I, I find it sad that I have to say this, but it's important to understand that Patterson, Gibson, and Katz were simply assigning numbers to RAID techniques in the order they thought of them. These are not hierarchical. Yes, RAID 6 provides a higher level of redundancy than RAID 5, <clears throat> but RAID 5 does not necessarily provide a higher level of redundancy than RAID 1. Back in the day, I used to see a lot of people buy three disk drives to go on the RAID controller to boot the server because RAID 5 was better than RAID 1, even though they didn't need the space on the boot volume <coughs> and could have used a mirror of two drives instead of a RAID 5 set of three. And of course, the mirrored set would have been faster for most reads and small writes. So you choose RAID levels or you choose your data protection scheme in general, not because the number's higher, so it must be better. Still to come in this series, um, how the academic paper turned into products, um, how we've gotten even better data protection via distributed blocks and erasure codes, the math of data protection and our risk of data loss estimators. Um, you can follow the blog, which in some cases has more detail than the webinars at www.deepstorage.net. And hopefully somebody's got a question or three. Hey, we've got a, uh, <coughs> a couple of comments out there. Uh, Graham has a comment about merger FS. I'm not sure if you heard about that. He said it allows multiple parity disks, but parity is calculated asynchronously, uh, mostly don't, for reads. Yeah, don't know it. Okay. So uh, we also have Ken Nalbone who says that he's a very happy Unraid home user. So he really likes Unraid. Yeah, I think I think Unraid's a great solution for home users because the performance of one disk drive is probably about right for streaming the video anyway. And you know the ability to just buy whatever drive is cheap at fries when you run out of capacity is just right. And the S rate is still kind of messing with me a little bit. So this, it was, seemed really weird. I'm glad it didn't catch on. It it was really weird, um, and I think that really just what happened is IBM got a little bit looser about how closely you had to emulate things. <clears throat> and it didn't become, you know, and that the ability to exactly emulate the physical device no longer mattered. So uh, but, when you're... Yeah, my problem my problem with it was that it didn't give you any capacity advantage. So I needed a 40 gigabyte LUN and I had to get <clears throat> five nine gig virtual drives out of the RAID S and then glue them together into a RAID 0 in the volume manager to get the capacity. Yeah. Um, so when you're consulting, what are you know, the more common RAID sets that you're seeing? So we went through a really great deep dive of all the RAIDs, but in the real world, what, are you, what do you really see out there? Well, well in the <clears> – there's <throat> a couple of things. First of all, in the real world, modern storage systems don't do – RAID where the drive, where, where D is a drive. You know, even, <clears throat> even more conventional RAID systems, uh, you know, more conventional storage systems do distributed RAID, where, yes, well, a, a stripe is six plus two, but that's not, 
to eight drives, it's the first stripe gets written to these eight drives and the next stripe gets written to those other eight drives um, so that the data is much more distributed. And that means that the IO load of all of your applications is distributed across all those positioners. But more importantly, I've got flash in front of it. And so there's a, a smart log-based system that means that I'm not doing 2K writes to a physical drive that has that therefore creates a read modify write cycle those writes are getting aggregated in some ssds and then they're getting written down as full stripe writes so that i don't have to do read modify write <clears throat> so you know it's, we, we're starting with with base principles but you know we're also talking about buggy whips <laughs> So uh, Matt Crape has another question. Uh, given that Flash and SSD is commonplace now, do you ever see RAID 0 deployed, and does that still have a place in the world? No. I, I don't see a place for RAID 0. You know, there, there may be some, you know, t the, the 10 users must go fast, must stripe this data across six NVMe SSDs, but... <clears throat> One NVMe SSD is plenty fast for most applications. All right, I'm not seeing anything else coming. That That's great. I have all kinds of fun snarky comments I can think of about where RAID 0 would be used in benchmarking. Oh, uh, yeah, well. But, but, but in the real world, yeah, I don't think there's any use for it. <clears throat> when I was, you know, back in the late 80s, when I was at PC Magazine, um, there <clears throat> we were at Comdex, and they were some company was demonstrating the software that was running just amazingly fast. <clears throat> and one of the guys got into the booth and pulled aside a curtain, and there was a microvax behind the curtain. And, you know, the reason that PC software was running that fast is there wasn't any PC. It was running on a much bigger computer. And the next show, we showed up with buttons that said that uh, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from rig demo. Yeah, you always have to be careful and take stuff that uh, comes out with a grain of salt. <clears throat> yep. All right. Uh, and I guess we'll... Uh... Another comment here from Ken. He likes RAID 0 as a disk-based Russian roulette. <laughs> you know, I've never been big on Russian roulette. Yeah, you just have to wait for it to go wrong once, and then... Uh, it's gone, yeah. gone wrong for me too many times. Yeah. <clears throat> I've, I've been the guy who's walked in and... Uh, replaced the wrong drive because the system said replace drive seven and i forgot which system it was and whether they were numbered horizontally or vertically so i don't need any additional risk yeah, so um with that i think i'll echo nicholas whenever he says thank you for taking the time to educate us uh this has been fantastic. Oh, my pleasure we all use raid and now we kind of understand what it is. I, I, I think a lot of times as a system admin, I've trusted the black box on your basic technology. So it's good to have a, a deep dive into the history of it. So thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. More to come. <clears throat> Great, we look forward to it. So uh, thanks everyone for joining and we will see you next week. <laughs>